you will get to them at the end of the presentations. Um, if you choose to ask your questions otherwise, please use the raise hand function so we can see. At this point, you know we have close to 80 or so uh, participants. We won't be able to get to you uh, otherwise. Um, okay, uh, thank you in advance for your cooperation. And now I turn it over to Lucy. Lucy, thank you. Thank you, Kim, and I hope you can hear me. <laughs> uh, so hello and, and welcome to everybody to this, this evening's program on conservation, connectivity and cooperation. I'm really delighted to share the screen with three distinguished conservation leaders, uh, Kim Elliman of the Open Space Institute Bill Schuster of Black Rock Forest and New York State Park Commissioner Eric Kulisade. As you know, for decades, these organizations have been at the forefront of protecting people and land, of protecting land and creating safe and welcoming places for people and wildlife here in the Western Highlands and beyond. Also, I want to offer a special welcome to several key conservation allies in the region including the Palisades Interstate Park Commission and its president, David Mortimer, the Palisades Park Conservancy, the Orange County Land Trust, the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference and Storm King Art Center. And if you look at the participants, there are many wonderful participants who've been involved in these uh, causes for a long time. And I'm sorry, I can't mention all of you. Strong partnerships make for strong projects, and I'm delighted to be joined by all of these wonderful conservation partners. We are here to discuss the newly announced Hudson Highlands West Co Trail Connectivity Plan, which was issued by the Open Space Institute in February. Each of the organizations represented here played an important role in the creation of this masterful strategic plan, which advances conservation, outdoor recreation, the protection of bird and wildlife habitat, and economic opportunities for this fast growing region. What is particularly exciting about this connectivity blueprint is thanks to generations of land protection and stewardship, the pieces are already in place to make this plan a success. I, believe that the potential impact of, of this plan is among the is the most far reaching I've seen in nearly 20 years of being involved in New York State parks. Think of it, the opportunity to connect six state parks, Black Rock Forest, Storm King, 93,000 acres of protective land through an extensive network of trails, all within an hour's drive from New York City is both daunting and really, truly very exciting. So with that, I would like to um, proceed with our program and reintroduce Kim Elliman, the phenomenal president and CEO of the Open Space Institute. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. The phenomenon is, uh, is still, <laughs> I still show up. Um, so, um, Lucy, let me comment now briefly about you. Um, you have shown such eternal leadership and grace during your two decades at State Council in the Parks. As chair, you've overseen a wonderful renaissance that's occurring throughout state, New York State Parks. Um, you've been a friend, mentor, supporter, and guide to so many of us, including the current commissioner, um, Eric Kulisade. Uh, Eric and Carol Ash, 12 years ago, started what is now OSI's park program, and we've benefited enormously from your participation and theirs. Um, and it's been the key to what we are now talking about, the Western Highlands Initiative um, that we're describing tonight. So um, Lucy already reviewed uh, this list. Uh, these were the participants in developing this plan. And again, I thank you all. There are too many people to, to note, um, but I wanna thank you, uh, the org partner organizations and leaders um, and many, most of you are here tonight. Uh, Lucy noted um, this park plan, there's 93,000 acres, uh, including West Point. Um, 
as Lucy noted, this effort is an exemplar of how we are working together to envision and create a landscape that offers wide public access and connects once again the parklands of the <laughs> islands to natural areas and to and with the Hudson River towns. Um, before we fully engage um, in a conversation about the future of the region, allow me to offer um, a couple of comments um, and a very brief historic overview of the land and the people. So for some 13,000 years, the this Lenape Hokine region, home of the Lenape people, extended the length of the Hudson Valley down into Delaware from Western Connecticut to Eastern Pennsylvania. The Lenape's culture related to landscape as a single unit, managed and respected holistically. The Lenape harvested their lands and waters for fish and game, for crops and trade goods, all the while fostering connectivity of the land and water. The Lenape, like so many indigenous people of that time, were forcibly removed from their lands, ultimately migrating to Wisconsin, Oklahoma, and Ontario. They suffered tragic depopulation from disease, famine, and war. After the replacement of the Lenape, the Hudson Highlands experienced four eras of threats to its ecology, deforestation, industrialization, mining, and energy. Deforestation, First the Dutch and then the English cut their forests for charcoal and timber and cleared the land for agriculture. With many of the large landowners of the time employing slave labor to work the fields and forests. During the industrial age, um, the industrial age came to the highlands marked with iron mines around Sterling Forest and with mills along the river. And the river itself became a trade and manufacturing corridor for raw commodities and goods. Mining. At the turn of the 20th century, it was a new threat, the mining of the Palisades and the cliffs of the Hudson River for building materials, think brownstones in New York City, that launched the progressive era of preservation and Theodore Roosevelt's creation of the Palisades Interstate Park Commission. Throughout this period, prominent families spearheaded the preservation of this landscape. The Roosevelt's, Rockefeller's, Harriman's, Stillman's, Perkins, Wallace's, Golden's, and Ogden Stern families have championed Highlands West conservation for over 120 years. Thanks to their generosity, their commitment, and their leadership, such locations as Bear Mountain, Storm King Mountain, and Harriman State Parks and Black Rock Forests are permanently protected and welcoming to the public. 50 years later, it was energy's turn with the proposed gouging of the mountainous peak of Storm King State Park for a hydroelectric reservoir. The ensuing lawsuit gave rise to the modern environmental movement and the careers of John Adams and Ned Ames, who are on this call tonight, and organizations like the Open Space Institute, Scenic Hudson, and Riverkeeper, among others. In the past 30 years, land groups, including OSI, have converted still more private land holdings to public ownership and use. Scunamonk State Park, Sterling Forest State Park, expansion of Goose Pond State Park, Harriman State Park, and critical other holdings that stitch the landscape together, all totaled, as Lucy mentioned, this landscape enjoys 93,000 acres of protected lands. Shown here in orange, I'm proud to say is the land protected by the Open Space Institute over the past 40 years, with many of our terrific partners having protected still more of this landscape. The challenge now, perhaps drawing inspiration from the Lenape people, is to put connections back in nature. Not just park to park, but parks to people and, plant and an plants and animals to preserves and protected corridors. And that's what these squiggly trail marks um, show on this map. Um, they are connections of humans and connections for nature. The goal of landscape conservation is changing. With the creation of the Highlands West Connex Connections Initiative, we look to provide facilities and access for all citizens, which Com Commissioner Kulisade will speak to, and to recreate biological and climate resilient landscapes for native flora and fauna, which Bill Schuster will address momentarily. Black Rock Forest is an integral piece of the protected land here in the Highlands. Conceived 100 years ago as a research forest, it is an unparalleled record of forest data for this region. It also provides miles of recreational trails and outdoor education for thousands of school kids. We are lucky to have Black Rock Forest in this region, and I'm happy to turn over the virtual reins to Dr. Bill Schuster, a longtime friend, and exceptional executive director of Black Rock Forest.
All right, well, thank you very much, Kim, and thank you, Lucy, too, and Open Space Institute for co-hosting this event with us. We appreciate very much the history that you share with us, Kim, uh, the legacy of those who came before us, and the great new vision represented by the Highlands West plan. And we appreciate how Open Space Institute has long recognized the importance of science in guiding conservation actions, as we have collaborated with you on for nearly 30 years. I'll start sharing my screen now. <clears throat> Here we are. Can you see that? Okay. Part of Black Rock Forest's mission as a science organization is to foster and conduct science to assist in strategic conservation, helping guide which lands get protected and how they are managed. Part of our focus, especially recently, has been on native wildlife and its needs for connectivity to assure their sustainability for the future. This work is led by Dr. Scott LaPointe on our staff. The lands Kim highlighted are indeed national treasures. This map shows Sterling Forest in Harriman State Park in the south and Scunamonk Black Rock Forest and Stork King State Park to the north with a layer of nature conservancy data showing how highly these lands score for biodiversity and resilience. However, they're separated, in many cases fragmented, and in some cases by serious barriers. Science has shown how isolated habitat fragments naturally lose species over time. And as numbers of individuals decrease, populations can be lost entirely by factors like disease, changing climate, or even just by random chance. Wildlife studies show that all species need to move across the landscape on scales from small to large to meet their basic needs, disperse and interbreed, and to adapt to environmental changes. This kind of movement is shown on the right in an animation of the movement of one of Black Rock Forest bobcats that was temporarily outfitted with a GPS collar. Both worldwide and locally, roads and highways represent some of the most significant barriers to wildlife movement. They were constructed to let us drive around efficiently, but were not designed to allow animal movement. At the worst, they serve as killing grounds. This figure shows the track of a dispersing male fisher that Scott tracked for 300 kilometers over the course of a month, only to get killed crossing a road at the end. This is all too common. In our area, in just the last several years, we've had five river, river otters killed trying to cross roads. On the human side, in the US, deer vehicle collisions result in 200 human deaths each year and more than 10,000 injuries. And the total cost of wildlife vehicle collisions is estimated to be $8 billion per year. Since the latter part of the 20th century, Science guided crossing structures, such as in the figure shown here, have been designed and built all around the world. And the data have shown that they work. But for a variety of reasons, the Northeastern United States has lagged far behind in this global effort. Our roads remain significant barriers. And at Black Rock Forest, we're studying this to quantify the effects and help produce future road redesign solutions. Location selection for crossing structures is critical. No single structure or suite of structures will fix all problems. But the biggest benefit can be achieved by connecting core habitat areas. In our area, that's largely our state parks. We have focused our studies initially on the roughly 25,000 acres stretching from Scunamonk State Park east through Black Rock Forest to Storm King, all in Orange County, which is experiencing heavy development pressure. Scott and his team have taken hundreds of thousands of camera trap photos over the past few years. Each dot here represents a camera trap location and the size of the circle represents the number of target species occurrences. 
Carnivores are particularly critical to sustain ecosystem health. And here we show the distribution of two species, bobcats in orange and fishers in pink. And you see the throughway running in between them. Our results indicate that they are fragmented and that this is at least in part due to the barrier nature of our highways. Here are data sets from two local bobcats showing their behavior in relation to roads. Bobcat A on the left avoids the heavily trafficked Route 6, which also has a concrete median barrier, and only crosses the much less busy Route 293 at a couple of key selected locations. But Bobcat B on the right, probably a dispersing female, repeatedly crosses over the New York State Thruway. Rarely, she has used one culvert to pass under the thruway, but these structures were not designed for animals to use, only to convey water. We only hope that she will survive until we eventually have safer crossing solutions. The data show also that in this stretch along Scunamook Mountain, six state reported deer vehicle collisions on average occur each year. But studies have shown how these reported accident data are vast undercounts of the true total number of wildlife vehicle collisions. Extrapolations suggest that these may number more than 100 in this stretch every year. We aim to continue science studies to hopefully guide the development of solutions. With Palisades Interstate Park, we are working to develop an agreed upon suite of indicator species to track. Some of these are shown in the upper right. We're continuing with the intensive camera trapping as well as GPS tracking. With the Thruway Authority's permission, we're extending our study of animal culvert use. Coyotes, for example, seem amenable, while other animals seldom or never use them. And we hope to be able to follow up this work with genetic measurements of gene flow, or the lack of gene flow in indicator species, and track how this changes over time. On the bottom right is our scat tracking dog, Fly, uh, with Scudamonk Mountain in the background, who last week found 15 bobcat scats in just one day, from which we can extract DNA for future analysis. If we want to ensure a sustainable future for this beautiful region, enhancing connectivity is essential. Reconnecting, guided by science, has been shown to be of lasting benefit to both wildlife and people. New York could potentially play a leading role in this area, and we are fortunate to have great leadership in place. It's my pleasure now to introduce New York State's terrific Commissioner of Parks, Eric Kulisay. Thank you, Bill. Uh, and I'm gonna share some slides in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, First of all, I just want to say thank you. you know, on behalf of Governor Cuomo, uh, it's my pleasure to attend this forum to talk uh, on behalf of, of the past, the present, and the future uh, of the Western Hudson Highlands uh, from the vantage point of state parks. Uh, thank you to Open Space Institute and to Black Rock Forest for pulling this together. Uh, thank you to Lucy for, for leading us off. Uh, and I also wanted, uh, I want to recognize um, David Mortimer, who's the, who's the president of the Palisades Interstate Park Commission. And I don't know whether Joshua Laird is, is on the line, who's the executive director of the Palisades Interstate Park Commission, uh, members of our team. Uh, thank you all for, for being here. Uh, thanks to Storm King Arts Center, Orange County Land Trust and the Trail Conference. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just be, so I'm gonna focus on sort of the human ecology, the human, the human, the human, uh, the, 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 the human uses of these incredible landscapes that we preserve. Uh, but I'm gonna start, I'm gonna put on some screens. Uh, nope, not me. Don't wanna put me on, you can see me enough. Uh, and I'm gonna talk, gonna sort of pivot south a little bit first. Um, just to sort of talk about, you know, Kim talked about the sort of the history that about a couple of parks that are 100 years old and, and just sort of how they fit into the context of what we're talking here tonight. Um, so this is all a little bit south of, of the area that, that Bill was just identifying, but Harriman and Bear Mountain are obviously uh, enormous parks that we have. We have nine state parks and historic sites in the Highlands portion of the, of the Palisades region. Our two flagships though, are two thirds of the 81,000 acres of land that we own uh, in this area. Um, 
we are, uh, but, and I think the, the, the main thing we, you know, when you think about the human ecology of this landscape, uh, and this is actually, thank you to OSI uh, for these uh, reports that were done. Um, it's hard to believe it's already uh, seven and eight years ago, uh, looking at, you know, who are, the, who are the humans that use our ecology, right? And, and so much of this area in particular is really the, it is the lungs, it's the green lungs of, of the downstate region and I just want to sort of, it, it, these, are, these areas are critically important to a, to a broad swath of, of people. Um, in Harriman and Bear Mountain itself, um, we are, um, you know, we get about 4 million visitors a year, uh, which is a, a huge number. Uh, and we are close to capacity. We reach capacity a lot. I think I like to tell the story of, you know, July 4th at Lake Welch when the first car pulls in at four in the morning to get there for, to get there for July 4th to get their favorite pick a star. You know, these are popular areas. Uh, in the last year, because of COVID, uh, that those, 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 those that has just continued uh, with increasing closures. And in the backdrop, um, there is a story of, um, of decline, of, of declining capacity. Uh, you know, I, uh, if you all, you may all recall at one time, Bear Mountain had actually a ski jump. Uh, there was a ski slope at Silver Mine. Uh, uh, um, uh, Anthony Wayne had a, a, a swimming pool uh, in Lake Sebago, uh, had a beach. There was, we have actually reduced our capacity. I think, you know, one of the things we, were, one of the things I think the, one of the important, one of the huge things for us in this northern area we, we're, gonna, we're talking about is it, it gives us, it's sort of a relief valve, but we also need to complement that with taking action in our core parks down south, because that is, that is where we are the most infrastructure and the most ability to welcome people, uh, because we're not, you know, we can't throw everyone into Cornwall and to, uh, and to the Black Rock area, right? Uh, we have to address our own. And so this is just, I'm gonna just page you through a couple of slides just to sort of show you know, this is this is our our picnic grounds at at, uh, at Bear Mountain, uh, beautiful beautiful Hessian Lake. But you'll see it's a place that's very overrun. Lots of you know, there's really very little natural vegetation. There's it's no room. People it's really over uh, overburdened with people. And so we need to take a look at this. This is probably a landscape we need to harden, right? We need to make this more of a place where where we can welcome people, really uh, welcome the masses, welcome the huge numbers of people coming coming from outside the area. Uh, but also offer them a beautiful experience. You know, at Bear Mountain, we're also looking at, we have an awful lot of, of unprogrammed green space and there may be an opportunity to welcome people in here with more picnicking and more facilities so that people can do more uh, in our core areas where we are, like I said, positioned to welcome people. There are places we have destinations where we have infrastructure, we have highways, we have the Palisades Parkway, we have Seven Lakes Drive. Uh, also just thinking about uh, building the park experience with gateways that make that remind people of where they are, uh, welcome them to experience and give people a sense of transition from their from their ordinary lives into what is really one of the one of the great park complexes in the state, if not the country, uh, which is Bear Mountain and Harriman. Here you're just looking at at, at, at Sebago, Lake Sebago used to be steady overflow for people coming from, you know, people coming from the city. It was one of our principal beach parks. We used to have three, now we have two at Lake Wells and Tiarati. This has been closed since 2011, since uh, tropical storms Irene and Lee came through and we've not rebuilt it. Uh, we need to rethink it. This is what it looks like now. It's an opportunity really to not only reopen this landscape, provide a place for people to go, to meet people where they are, to offer, uh, to offer um, recreational instruction work with partners, but also to do it in a new way, you know, without necessarily the sand and the other things that, um, you know, without the, without the sort of the, 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 the uh, sort of Moses era uh, boardwalk and sand. Here, this is, the, this is Anthony Wayne, which is a large parking lot right now. Right now, it's a testing site for COVID uh, right on the Palisades Parkway. Uh, it happens to be right at a, an advantageous place for the Appalachian Trail. And imagine if we had an Appalachian Trail center here where people could actually uh, a New York focused uh, a center to get people out on the Appalachian Trail. Just sort of some of the ideas that we are, 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 are running through. And then this is the southern end of Harriman. If you've been, if you've driven Seven Lakes Drive on a weekend, uh, this actually, this, 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 this uh, slide is inaccurate because it's really both sides of this road are lined with cars, uh, with people trying to get in there. Uh, we need to make the experience more of that here with better parking and better access to 
uh, into these landscapes. So this is just a way, again, to frame um, a complement to what we're talking about in the northern part of the Western Highlands, where we need to, where we have an opportunity to stitch together these parks, not only for wildlife, but for people. So if you come up into, if you come up into this area, you know, and, and, I, and I will credit, I give credit to Open Space Institute for, for really leading us and helping us get into this landscape, you know, helping us to expand our footprint. Obviously, we've been adding, with their help, lots of acreage to Skunamunk. Uh, and with their help, we're looking at, um, we're looking at the possibility for, for extending trails to Goose Pond Mountain. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that OSI is working on those things. We're talking to the uh, town of Cornwall and Hudson about creating a loop trail that will connect our park to the town's Donahue Memorial Park. Uh, on the other side of the, uh, of the throughway here, Legacy Ridge is obviously a, a, an acquisition that we worked on with OSI uh, and, is, and it really brings closer uh, the possibility of what Bill talked about in his talk about some potential land bridge. If we can bring the parkland closer on both sides, uh, we can do that. Uh, also looking at Sterling Forest in the south, which again um, is OSI, TPL, and many partners who help pull that together. Uh, so we are, we are very interested in this area. I note that, that that train running through there offers, you know, the riders the chance to get to this area from Manhattan. Uh, and it is a, uh, it's, it's a it, this is a landscape that could actually take more people without overburdening it. And we are very much uh, supportive uh, and, and enthusiastic about helping OSI and Black Rock uh, to expand kind of the network and for people, for allowing people to get back and forth in this landscape, uh, just as we saw that Fisher and that Bobcat uh, moving back and forth. And I think, uh, again, that's, that's really it uh, for me. I think I just, I think we're gonna kick it over to, uh, kick it back over to, uh, uh, to Kim and OSI and Black Rock for, for a discussion from here on. But thank, thanks for letting me address you. Thank you, Eric. It's always great to see you. Um, and thank you for that quick run through of your plans um, and very ambitious plans. You're, you would be the first to say um, there's so many issues now that we have to think very creatively and frankly act aggressively as Eric and State Parks and Governor Cuomo have done for these past 10 years um, to make sure that we have adequate facilities for the people who do want to get into these natural areas. Um, anyway, thank you, Eric, for that riveting, exciting presentation. And now I thought we'd move to the Q&A portion of the meeting. And again, two ways you can ask a question. Um, one is you can add it to the chat function uh, in the middle of the lower bar there on your screen. Or if you look under reactions, Again, there's a lower, if you click that, there's a lower bar that says raise hand. And uh, either I or someone more skillful with younger eyes will find um, that you want to ask a question and we'll continue. you. Um, I will initially, just to get this going, um, Tally Blumberg, my colleague, um, has been monitoring the chat room. And she might just ask one or two questions from there to get the ball rolling. Thank you. I have a few questions and Bill, I think this one is for you and it's multi-part. How many species are you tracking at Black Rock Forest currently? And which of those are the most threatened and what gives you hope in all of this work? Um, thank you, I'll try to remember those in sequence. Um, we don't track nearly as many species as we'd like to be able to. The staff is small. Um, we're fortunate to have a number of great scientists working, um, but each focuses on their particular area. We have compiled a list of 41 species of concern, and um, those species are uh, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds that are known to be present, but only in small population sizes. And those are the ones we're concerned about trying to make sure they, they last for the long run. Um, carnivores, as I mentioned, are really important because they help keep down what can be an overburgeoning deer population that has all kinds of bad effects on the landscape. So that's one reason why I showed you work about bobcats. Um, bears seem to be doing well, but also they need their natural places and to be able to move safely between them so that they don't end up in the middle of our communities causing problems. So um, 
uh, again, with this particular project, we're working with Palisades Park to try to pick a suite of organisms that span different taxa that we can track uh, together over time. And they will probably in include uh, species from different uh, um, groups. Um, what gives me optimism over time? Uh, wildlife are pretty resilient. You know, we've seen a return of carnivores. Um, years ago, there were no bears around here. There were probably bobcats, but you never saw them. Um, coyotes have moved back in. Deer populations, at least here, are down, and the trees are regenerating again. So I'm a forest ecologist, uh, and I feel a responsibility for making sure there's forest for the future. And seeing those new trees coming up again, that's something that gives me hope, saying that, you know, we understand some things, we learn some things, we change the management around a little bit, and we see improvement in the landscape. And Tally, I missed the middle question, I think. No, I think you got it. Which are the okay. most threatened species? Thank you, Bill. Uh, next question to Commissioner Kulisade. Can you speak to some of the trends in usership and how do we balance people and nature? And is there a point when there are too many people and then what happens? That's a great question, right? Um, I think, and, and I think one of the things that we've noticed about, you know, the COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic, right, is that we've seen expanded visitation in our shoulder seasons, right? I mean, we've seen numbers in our, in our so we've seen differences in usage in, with fall and spring and even winter explosive use. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I guess that goes straight to my point is that um, we need to balance it. I mean, there are certain places that can take more and there are certain places, if you think about, I think of, and I think the trend, I think it, the trail conference, great credit for, for taking a place like Bear Mountain, right? The trail up in front of Bear Mountain that was full of uh, eroded pathways, social pathways, and very heavily used, most heavily trafficked piece of the Appalachian Trail. And the question was, you know, do you limit usage or do you take some steps to harden it so that you can so you can take more people there. So I think I think the point is that there are places where we can take more people. We can take more people at Sebago. We can take more people at Anthony Wayne. We have we have en so enormous parking lots along Seven Lakes Drive that we actually walked away from. We need to build the rebuild the capacity there. Places like the landscape we're talking about here, west of Hudson, it doesn't have the same infrastructure and the ability to welcome people. So there, you got to be more balanced. So hopefully we're doing, we're, we're increasing capacity where we can, where it makes sense to harden even, harden our landscapes and then and be more sensitive in these places like like the the, the Western Highland, the Skunamuk area where, where we gotta be more cautious. Thank you, commissioner. Uh, next question goes to Kim. Uh, what is the best way forward and a strategic, uh, Leo Klosky, what is the best way forward, perhaps some sort of shared strategic plan? And then I'm combining it with another question. Um, are there specific targets and what are those? Yeah, um, very good question, which always gives me and Eric and others a couple of seconds to think about how, how to frame an answer to a good question. Um, so, um, this effort itself is a strategic plan. And let me once again echo Lucy and, and Bill and Eric um, in my previous comments. Those organizations and others that you saw, saw on that slide um, of the partner organizations, we have all been involved with this planning process for three years to do exactly that, to get on the same page about what a long-term strategy has been. And to the extent to which um, Palisades Interstate Park Commissioner um, Commission, um, Pipsy has been involved um, now with Joshua Laird. Um, we have been working with the state officials too and other state agencies as needed to see if we can move forward. I don't know if um, Maria, you can put the last slide from my slideshow on, but that really shows um, some of the biological and human connectors that we're really, if you can blow that up somehow, the one with a lot of orange and a lot of squiggles on it. This in some respects is a summary uh, in, in graphic map form of the strategic plan. Now this is iterative and um, some of this is, will change depending upon, you know, permitting and funding and, you know, land acquisitions. There are some other land priorities that we do. I mean, ideally in a perfect world, you can start 
to the south to Stirling Forest, which or as, as you see already has a connection connection now um, through some of the lands that OSI recently bought from um, uh, with the generosity of the Mortimers um, that cross uh, the throughway there into Harriman State Park. But we would also like to create a connector up to Legacy Ridge, Scunamonk State Park and Black Rock Forest. Black Rock Forest was the first here and developed a plan um, and a real vision that in some respects we are all keen off of, of how to get wildlife across the throughway. Um, Bill showed an overview of a land bridge. We're looking at um, various old railroad passes and throughway passes. And you see the black line, I mean, the brown line up above, that is a rail trail that we hope to connect uh, Cornwall ultimately all the way with Goose Pond State Park. And then it can loop back on other rail trails um, and public roads. So you get loops either for bikes or walks um, or people who just want to take um, a, a stroll in their neighborhood. So um, those squiggly um, colored squiggly lines are all concepts. Some exist, some don't um, for how we have a network of trails that connect this land. Um, there's also another land agenda. I mean, you can see the obvious one is to, and I'll shut up in a second, go from Goose Pond down to uh, Sterling Forest, due south. So um, this is the product of three years in, in numerous organizations, and hopefully we will include still more organizations going forward. Thanks, Kim. Uh, back to the commissioner from Jim Ottaway. Um, has your state's park, has, has the state park's budget been severely cut? And does that mean all the improvements that you've outlined and, and illustrated for the, for the audience tonight can't be made in a timely fashion? Uh, so the, um, the, uh, the capital budget is actually fairly strong. Governor Cuomo just, uh, we, we've just come off of something called Parks 2020 in which we've spent a billion dollars in the state parks. Um, in the last 10 years. Uh, it's really one of the governor's signature programs. We've succeeded, we've succeeded in rolling that over into Parks 100. We have Parks 100, we just launched, the governor just launched this January, which is an effort to spend another $440 million by uh, 2024 in recognition of the fact that the state park system uh, is hitting its 100th birthday in 2024. So capital wise, um, you know, it, it's actually kind of amazing after a billion dollars that we can still have uh, projects left to do, but it's a measure of, of how developed our system is uh, and how many historic structures we have, right? You know, Jones Beach, Niagara Falls, we have a lot of heavy infrastructure and Harriman and Bear Mountain uh, really are due for getting this kind of reinvestment. So on the capital side, uh, no, we, we, we think that we've got a pretty good, uh, we've got a pretty good handle on, on being able to, to address those things over a, you know, eight year or some kind of multi-year time frame uh, going forward. And, and let me shout out um, the work that State Parks has done. I mean, Eric and his team and predecessors have just really done a great job um, rethinking State Parks. And thank God they did because post COVID, the use is way up. So Commissioner, thank you. The other side of the economics, another question. Uh, can Kim, I think, uh, address development pressure and um, how we are working and taking into account these towns needs to grow and to grow their tax bases and so forth. So um, those are, are, are two questions and let me take um, the first first, which is development pressure. You know, it's really interesting in this COVID world, everyone talks about migration to suburbia and the Hudson Valley and all of that's true. and. Generally, we're seeing in Orange County uh, appreciation in real estate prices for developed land of about 30%. Um, now, you know, the economists around and, you know, the extent to which I've, I've had decades of experiences, that may subside if COVID is really um, behind us and if the state can open up. But that's developed property. There's very little raw land development pressure. Um, there, there is, we, OSI deals with developers a fair bit, and we were talking to Toll Brothers, which is one of the largest developers in the country, and they reported that they have no development plans for the Hudson Valley. 
they just do not want to go through the permitting process. They don't want to commit that kind of capital. Um, they have plenty of product without trying to develop new product. So that's one question. I mean, in spite of what you're seeing, there's very little open space and raw land development pressure right now. This is not like um, the aughts. Um, the other part is how do we increase the uh, tax base um, and the rateables? And, you know, it's frankly um, that pressure that has driven up real estate prices should, in some respects, create a higher tax base and higher rateables. Now, I can't tell you how often one town or another town does the reassessment, um, but when that reassessment happens at these higher values, you should have more rateables. Um, so you would have, if you don't change the mill rate, and of course that's all politics, um, you would have, uh, the, the third, uh, you, you would have a, a more robust tax um, revenue um, situation. The, the third thing I would point out, and none of us quite knows how this is gonna work, much as Eric has talked about all the money that's going to state parks, the infrastructure bill, whether it's one trillion or three trillion, is going to, um, uh, give a lot of communities um, relatively inexpensive capital to rebuild those things that otherwise they'd have to look to local tax revenue to do. Um, so I, I'm actually quite optimistic uh, in the short term and maybe even interim term of, of tax bases in the Hudson Valley. Thanks, Kim. That's a positive answer. Uh, I have a request, uh, Doug Land. Hi there. Hey, Tali. And hey, everybody. It's great to see really so many very familiar faces on this call. Um, a couple of comments. One specific to Kim's last comment. We actually see that directly in Cornwall. You know, the American Recovery Act alone is going to be providing funds that were unexpected. And I think for many of the communities in the Hudson Valley, and it's really important for us, when I say us, the 100 people on this call, to make sure that our community leaders know that these projects and some of the, the activities that would really support these projects could be a great use of some of those windfall funding. And we're doing that in Cornwall and I kind of suggest that everybody should think about that. Um, the other point, you know, I guess at least I wanted to raise was the Highlands Conservation Act is up for renewal in the federal uh, budget this year that directly impacts almost everything we're talking about here. And uh, Sean Maloney is the sponsor of the renewal. So obviously he's in favor of it, but you know that's 20 plus million dollars that can support a lot of these activities. So again, to the extent that, that all of us can make sure that our representatives know that the Highlands Conservation Act is a priority, it will fundamentally help you know, it, it is funds that can be used, you know, in addition to state funds, we can look to the federal government. Um, and I guess my final comment is a, a personal one. Um, Michelle Smith is on this call. Now she's a, uh, she's actually on the other side of the river. So she's not actually part of the Western project, but she's the very recently retired, like as of yesterday, the executive director of the uh, Hudson Highlands Land Trust and I just want to make a shout out. I know a lot of you know her, and she's been incredibly, incredibly supportive of all of these activities and uh, directly involved with Maloney's office and getting the Highland Conservation Act specifically to support some of these. So I guess this is an opportunity, Michelle, for 100 conservationists in the Hudson Valley to say thank you. And uh, we wish you luck. Doug, thank you, and thank you for all that you do, and Michelle, thank you as well. Uh, Michelle heard about the Highlands West plan and immediately picked up the phone and called uh, the commissioner and, and others and said, we want our own plan on the east side, so it was, it was great work. Um, I'm receiving a number of comments directly and some to the group. Uh, Bill, perhaps you can address um, the long path and other trails as, as usable corridors, not just for people, but for species. And uh, what, what, what is your thinking and, and this group on um, facilitating that further and how do we, how do we manage that? 
certainly that's a good and important question. One we need to think about and plan for. You know, the answer is not easy. There's not one easy solution. Uh, I'm a firm believer in uh, both human connectivity and connectivity for the rest of our um, fellow organisms on Earth. There can occasionally be conflicts. And so we need to pay attention to that. You know, in general, uh, hikers are not a problem. Huge volumes of people, though, will drive away species. Uh, ATVs are about the worst. You know, I wish they had their own ATV parks and didn't try to come onto state parks and some of the other lands where they can drive off the wildlife too. So, you know, with respect to crossing structures, for example, in a lot of places that there's been a paradigm shift and every time a highway or a road is changed or a culvert is fixed, we think about, you know, how can we make this area a little more permeable to our wildlife? And if you have numerous crossing structures, some of them can be the ones that the people mostly use, some of them can be the ones the wildlife use. So, you know, it takes careful planning, it takes careful thought, um, but in general, um, you know, light hiking is completely compatible with um, most of nature's connectivity. Thank you. Uh, on the subject of trails, I'm going back up. Uh, Commissioner, some of your proposals for improved trailheads are clearly are directly adjacent to aging trail infrastructure, such as degraded or missing bridges. Will the need for trail structure improvements be incorporated into these projects so that we don't have beautiful gateways leading to deficient trails? And in uh, full candor, this came from our great partners at the trail conference. Great partners at the trail conference. Yes, I, and actually I, I, I should give a shout out to the trail conference because uh, there's no better set of uh, volunteers out there. The way they the way they marshal volunteers and really uh, are stewards of, of so many miles and miles and miles of our trails is something we are uh, hugely grateful for. Um, yes, I mean we absolutely uh, yes we need to particularly that area. I think you must be talking about Reeves Meadow. Reeves Meadow obviously is a place where you know a lot of the trails are fairly degraded. There we need to get in there. We can't do this without without them. Uh, I, I note that uh, actually I, I'll give a little shout out to OSI also for, for uh, and, and West Point. Uh, I think I heard someone from West Point on this in the kind of work they've been helping us do with some of these bridges uh, on the east side of the river. We've been built, OSI has put in a lot of great bridges at Fondstock on some places where trail bridges or they were even trail bridges. So yes, uh, you can't do this without that. Um, uh, and, and certainly, you know, what, what, what happened at Bear Mountain needs to be replicated. We, we're doing a little bit of that at Breakneck right now uh, with the help of Cena Cutson. Uh, and we are, we need to do that in this area too, very much. Uh, can't do it without, and really we may have to harden some of these trails, especially where they're in the trunk portions, right? right? The places that are most heavily used. Think about ways to um, uh, stave off erosion and, and kind of social pathways that can, that can spill people into the woods and, and, and habitat in a way that uh, is not good for that. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner, and thanks, yes, to the trail conference. Uh, question for Bill. Um, do you use, do you use citizen scientists at Black Rock Forest and how can we get involved? All right, I love that question. Um, I think we increasingly do. And in fact, we have a citizen science biodiversity blitz coming up on uh, May 15th, Saturday, May 15th. If you'd like to uh, sign up, um, we're actually doing one in, in Central Park the following weekend on uh, May 22nd. We've got experts who are gonna show up and help uh, guide people around the landscape. And we're gonna try to tally up as many species as we can of, of uh, birds and plants specifically and then contribute them to the global iNaturalist database, which has really been a spectacular success. I mean, if you just use your phone and record things in iNaturalist, if it's verified by a number of people, it goes into databases that have been contributed to hundreds of papers. So there's a really good way, a really easy way with your phone that you and your kids or whatever uh, can contribute as citizen scientists. So um, we love it. I think some of the phenology records, you know, the, the timing of natural occurrences over the years um, have been recorded uh, wonderfully by uh, volunteers, the Black Rock Forest, Mohawk, other places like that. So uh, there's an increasing role, I think, for citizen science and increasing impact of it. So yeah, we're all for it. And please come on May 15th. Thank you, Bill. We can, so people can find that information on your website, I assume. Yes, indeed. Great. 
Thank you. Uh, another question that the commissioner and Kim can fight over perhaps. Um, who is using the parks in New York State, especially in this area close to New York City, and what are we doing to promote different types of usership? Uh, OSI wrote the book, but, but Kim, I'll, I'll take a start at this and I guess you can pick it up. So thanks to OSI, really. Um, OSI has studied this, right, and, and uh, did some reports early in the, in the teens uh, looking at usership, a lot of heavy usership from New York City. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the metropolitan area varies a little bit. What it, I, think, I think the thing for us, I think that the thing, the particular challenge that I'm consumed with these days is that we get a lot of people to our beaches and pools, you know, Bear Mountain, the Bear Mountain picnic areas, the uh, uh, Lake Welch, uh, those areas are full of people. Uh, we would like to, however, expand that population into sort of outdoor skills you know, we don't have, we have a lot of diversity in our beach parks and our picnic parks, less so uh, in our hikers and our kayakers and the people using that require a little more skill set. And so my, 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 my fervent uh, wish uh, is to get to a point where we are meeting people in those, in those places like Lake Welch and, and, figure, and, to, and being with them to sort of figure out how do we then make them into lifelong stewards of the landscape and bring them further out into the landscape so that they can enjoy the things that many of us on this phone, uh, on this call, take for granted. Right? It's a, it's a, uh, We all know. We all know what we get from nature. Uh, and I, my really overriding goal is to expand that. So, um, you know, th there, Eric was was modest to me. He oversaw the report that OSI did, um, and it is very interesting how many people come from you know northern bronx and westchester up to harriman in the osi is actually doing um and kathy mosher is overseeing that she's on the phone um today is overseeing a report called open space for all that's looking taking a deep dive into trends who uses the parks um what are the obstacles to use of the parks um how do we make parks more accommodating for those populations communities that we do want to encourage to get outdoors, to use parks, uh, get into nature. But a, a couple of national statistics that sort of echo some of the themes that Eric just noted. One is that 70% of park use um, across the country, state or national, tends to be local. And local there is defined by a 40 mile radius. Um, 30, only 30% 30 of park use, and most of it is weekend use, comes from outside that 40 mile radius. So in some respects, you have two different audiences. How do you accommodate for the people in the immediate vicinity of the parks? And how do you encourage use and um, make it uh, comfortable um, for people coming outside the parks? You know, one of the things we are looking at is access can be defined either in physical terms, such as Eric just did, where, you know, we want better parking, we want better trails, we want better bridges. Um, it could also be defined and again, Eric uh, presaged this in a way that talks more about the psychology. I mean, how do we get people comfortable in the woods, comfortable in nature? How do we introduce them to nature? And of course, Bill does that at BlackRock, um, State Parks does that a lot. Um, we are looking into it. But again, some really interesting national trends. 97% of the people who use national parks don't go beyond a quarter mile of the trailhead. So, Eric just noted that, but it's a national phenomenon. And so how do we figure out, how, how do we address that? And we can address that by reaching out to communities that historically haven't used the parks as much or don't feel as comfortable going into the woods. Um, anyway, that's a whole nother chapter and we could go on, um, but I'm mindful of time. And I'm mindful of the fact that at some point, Kathy Moser will do her own salon on this issue and be far more charming and um, prepared. Okay, two more questions. I wish you all could see the direct messages because we have a, a lot of excitement coming from the town of Cornwall. But the general question is, how can towns and municipalities help with all of these efforts and the execution of this plan? And uh, Leo, I think that you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, it's, it's Led Kosky. Um, I've been working with OSI, BlackRock Forest, and some of the other organizations on the phone call here, and it's been nothing but a pleasure as a citizen 
and volunteer to, to get involved with that. It's been, you know, uplifted my life in so many ways. Um, but in addition to that, um, I was the chair of the Comprehensive Plan Committee for the village of Cornwall and Hudson. I sit on the planning board for the town of Cornwall, and I'm deeply embedded in the ongoing construction activities at West Point. Um, and I believe those three communities between them are, they border much of the plan that, that uh, has been displayed here this evening. Um, and I think there's some wonderful ways to formally engage the planning mechanisms within those municipalities to further the plan that, that we saw this evening. One is, uh, as a for instance, within the, the comprehensive plan for the village of Cornwall and Hudson, which was just adopted, we actually embedded the Cornwall Natural Resources Inventory, which is a, a very formal piece of environmental work, uh, great depth to that, but it's in, the, it's in the plan as an appendix. That means that it's passed through the seeker process and has been formally adopted by the village as part of their vision of the future. What this plan lays out is a vision of the future for the whole region uh, on this west side. Um, and to the extent that we can formally embed that plan uh, within the ongoing planning of those municipalities uh, or those federal partners like West Point, I think that that effort would be, uh, I think it would pay off big in the long term. You know, what we're looking at is not a two-year or a five-year undertaking. We're looking at a, at a sustained undertaking, you know, as everything in the environment is, it's a, it's a multi-year sustained undertaking. You know, hopefully a hundred years from now, this is, this turns out to have been a good plan. Um, and that means engaging all of the major stakeholders across those, uh, especially those who are bordering this piece of, uh, grand plan for connectivity. So I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of it. And I, I think it's really a, it, it, it's a unique vision for the future, but one which the more people are aware of and in the more formal ways that they can be aware of it, the better we're gonna be in the long run. So thanks very much for the time. I appreciate you listening to that. Well, listen, that is a, Almost a wonderful conclusion, um, but I can't let you have the last word. Um, I probably have to give it to the commissioner, to the chairman of the state parks. Um, but mindful of time, it is now 631. Um, that is part of the agenda going forward. Um, and those are all terrific points. We need to engage more stakeholders. And in typical OSI fashion, we released this plan in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and I'm not sure anyone read it. Um, but post pandemic, we really do expect um, to try to engage the community in a more systemic way um, and systematic way. And we have wonderful partners in that, um, those that were noted before. Um, and I know the commissioner is deeply, deeply, I'll let him speak for himself, but I'm gonna put him on the spot, deeply and deeply committed to seeing through um, elements of, of this vision, knowing that we have to work with Cornwall and uh, Harriman and um, the other communities, including West Point. So we will probably look to you um, for some guidance and help as we sort of reach out to, to more stakeholders. Eric? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say yes. I, you know, obviously, I just want to thank again Ozai and BlackRock and Lucy uh, for convening all of us. Um, and I would say that this, 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 this um, strategic plan that's been put on the table is is great because for us, you know, um, our our capacity to do this kind of work and to think outside the box like you have is really what the private sector that's what the private sector adds to the public sector, right? And you're bringing so much to the table, so much thought, so much uh, expansive thinking, and you're helping us to live into that. And I I look very much toward putting state resources into this. I think I think also. One thing I think I love, I think the age of the age of the rail trail may be honest, you know, it's been out there for a long time, but these trail connectors, you know, that they don't have to be necessary through pristine wilderness everywhere. They can be on old rail beds and people are, you know, people are showing that they love it. They can get to places. These linear connections are really vital and a big part of the future. And that's what this area is, uh, is a lot about, creating those connections along those linear corridors. So very exciting. Thank you very much for this work and really look forward to continuing to the partnership to, to achieve a lot of these goals. So I am told that there's a question for Lucy, which is uh, perfect because I'm gonna let Lucy answer the question and have the last word. Um, and I'm, she will be ever gracious and thank you all and wish you all good night and the rest of the evening. Um, so Lucy, Tally. Uh, 
Lucy, uh, you've done so much for New York State. What excites you about this initiative and this landscape specifically? I think you're muted, Lucy. I, I am indeed. Now you can hear me? Yes. Um, I think I'm most in, in, excited by the um, mm, the the um, the ways that it will provide connectivity for birds, for people and wildlife. I think that is a rare opportunity that I haven't seen on this scale, and that and then it connecting it to the towns and the long pass is just um, there. There is so much that people when you make these connections are going to learn about nature and themselves and enjoying it. And so I think that all the presentations tonight have been spectacular and different and learned so much. And thank you to OSI for all your work in putting out this master plan and to all the participants, what a great group of people. And we've all got to work together to help make the plan a success. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Appreciate you showing up today.